Hi folks, so here we go. It's time to play more of the Game Fest CD. Last time was relatively uneventful. We saw some interesting games. I think this time will be also fairly uneventful. We have some nice games, but I guess nothing really too terribly uh, groundbreaking or exciting this time around. Just uh, some pretty good games on tap, I think. Uh, the first is Gate World. This uh, has nothing to do with... Uh, I believe there was a series of adventure games called Gate World. Actually, two of them. Yeah, there were there were two games called Gate World based on a series of science fiction novels. Unfortunately, I didn't play those games. Uh, but this is not those games. This is a completely different game. This is actually just a basic platformer. It's in Sophomore 7 Pro 2, so let's check it out. Oops, here we are. And as usual, I want to see, is there a text file that describes anything? Doesn't look like there's a file ID. Diz, but I don't see anything that looks particularly... Oh, there's a readme.doc. Okay, so what is the... Captain Klondike meets the Gorg machine. Part 1, the seed ship, over 2 megs of compressed graphics, ad-lib soundtrack, etc. Okay. Um, let's see, can I browse the readme file? Alright. This is from Homebrew Software, who also made other, uh, other shareware games. Can't remember too many of them right now, for some reason. I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad sign. Buckerville, California. Yes, a whole whole city named after cows. Uh, some BBSs here. I would be very surprised if any of these BBSs are still in existence today, uh, more than 20 years on. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and let's see how to run the game. All right, I guess I should do setup first. Uh, so let's go for... Uh, well, this is a fairly extensive list of sound... Cards. Most games just have ad lib and sound blaster, and that's it. But here you can choose the, you can choose some cards I don't even recognize. I mean, there were some sound cards that were pretty popular back in the day, like the Pro Audio Spectrum, of course, the Roland M the MT32. There was the uh, the Disney Sound Source, which for some reason is not listed here. There was the Kovac Speech thing, um, and some other stuff. Yeah, Turtle Beach also made popular sound cards back in the day, but. But uh, Area Sierra Semiconductor, that doesn't ring a bell for me. Neither does ASC Media Master Synth. Neither of those really. Uh, anyway, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's do the Sound Blaster Pro. Uh, what's the difference between OPL3 and Yamaha? I thought OPL3 is a Yamaha chip. Maybe I'm completely mistaken. All right, anyway, uh, yeah, let's go for Sound Blaster. All right, I guess that was it. That was the whole configuration. All right, now let's run uh, Git Git World. Will the O one? Here we go. Yeah, Gate World by Homebrew Software, copyright nineteen ninety three. This is a very new game. It's only twenty three years old as of the time of me making this video. So there's the Gorg base, and here are some credits. And here's the main menu, so I guess we don't need to, uh... Let's see, is there anything interesting worth reading here? Well, here's a preview. Yeah, this is sort of what the game looks like, kind of. It looks like a fairly typical... I guess it looks more like a, more or less like a fairly typical PC platform adventure game from back in the day. Um... Anyway, uh, size view? What's that? Oh, I see. This is like in, uh, like in Wolfenstein 3D, where you can change the size of the viewing area. Oh, wait. Here's the story. Let's look, let's look at the story. Time, the future. Okay. Uh, this is a this is the story, I guess. Oh boy, that guy. Uh, I seem to recall seeing those. Uh, that picture somewhere out of taken out of context. I don't know if the, this game was the originator of that because I seem to recall seeing those eyes somewhere before. But anyway, 
All right, is there anything to configure? Yeah, sound effects, music. Ooh, color cycling. Color cycling's nice. All right, let's play a new game. And of course, we play on easy because I'm bad at games. For somebody who plays so many games, I'm pretty bad at them. I sure play a lot of games for somebody who's so terrible at them. So, this game does use PC speaker sound for, uh... Oh, welcome to Gorg, you will die. Oh, I love this music. Hold on, let me try turning up the, the volume of the game a little bit, just, just so you, you can enjoy this music. Imagine, imagine my childhood in which I spent hours upon hours playing this game while listening to that music. This may explain uh, some special problems that I uh, that I retain to this day. Anyway, um, so yeah, those are some coins. I guess I don't know if those give you an extra life or if they're just for points. I think no, they, they don't give you points. So I guess they have some purpose. Yeah, obviously you can collect gunshots. I guess that's useful. Try to whoops. Man, that spike didn't even take off some of my health. It just killed me instantly. That's quite annoying. I remember liking the music in this game. Uh, it has very bizarre music, but actually... In a sense, it's, it's good music if you like that kind of thing. Put it this way, those of you who remember the, uh, the music in Droids Be Us in the VGA remake of Space Quest 1, if you liked that music, then, then this music is also your kind of thing. You have to hold jump while jumping on that thing at the same time to, uh... Oh, this blue star is coming with me now. I wonder what it does. Maybe it gives me, uh... Special powers. Or maybe it just gives me... I don't know what. Oh, touching those spikes on the ceiling also causes your head to explode. That's nice. Uh, this is not an easy game. Somehow I made it through this game and I don't remember... I made it through this shareware episode. I don't think I ever played the full game because it's you can probably already see it's really not a it's not a very good game. I mean, it's not a terrible game. I guess it's a somewhat competently made platformer, but there's really not a lot of reason to play this today considering that there are much better Oh dear. Oops. Yeah. There are really much better games available, uh, even from this era. I mean, already in the early 90s, uh, there were much better games than this available of this genre. And I don't think this game lets you save arbitrarily. I mean, I think you can probably save your game in this game, but you can only save at the beginning of levels, which I always thought was a stupid thing. I always, th I still think it's stupid. I, I always think it's a really dumb thing that you can't save in some games at arbitrary points. Okay, I'm, I'm bad at jumping over those spikes. All right, this has been Gate World. Let's just get out of here before I make an even bigger fool of myself. I obviously have no idea how to play this game. I have no idea how I played this game back in the day because, like I said, I actually did make it through the shareware episode, so I must have, I must have played this game for ridiculous amounts of time to actually manage to uh, do something with it. So anyway, Gate World. Yeah, that was Gate World. Uh, not an adventure game. I think I mentioned before, most of these games are not adventure games. Uh, but here is a game that is an adventure game. Uh, I probably, I don't feel too much need to go into too much detail on Hugo's House of Horrors because I did actually do a full Let's Play of this in a previous video. It's a short game. It's a very short game. I did it in one video, if I remember right. But yeah, Soft ADV Hugo 1. Let's see, what's actually in Soft AD, ADV? So we have the three Hugo games. And then we have the last, I guess that's the last half of Darkness. And those are the only two games here that are actually adventure games. Then you have Arctic Adventure and Monuments of Mars, which are twin platformer games. Uh, neither of them are adventures. And then Secret, I think, is Secret Agent, which is also a platformer, not an adventure game. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and play Hugo 1. Uh, yeah, here we go. H, 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 Triple H, Hugo's House of Horrors. Starring Hugo, share version 1.3s, copyright 1990 by David P. Gray. So this is Hugo's House of Horrors. I think most of you have probably seen this game. Uh, if you folks regularly watch my channel and have wa been watching my channel for a while, you probably remember this game because, like I said, I did play make a full playthrough of it before. Um, 
If you've never seen it before, there's really not a lot to say. It's basically just like old Sierra Adventures. This is actually the only shareware game I know of, which really does a good job of approximating the look and feel of, uh, of classic Sierra Adventure games. I mean, you walk around with the arrow keys, you type in commands into the, you know, text parser there at the bottom, and then the game complains that it doesn't understand what you typed in because adventure games usually don't, and then you type in enough commands and walk around enough that you finish the game. And that's basically the whole game. Uh, it's a good game. I really like these games. I really think these are fantastic games. Like I said, I think they're the only shareware games of this type that I know of. Um... Uh, and they're good. I mean, they are a trilogy. Uh, I only have played the first one uh, on YouTube. I mean, I've played through all three games myself, but I mean, in terms of making YouTube videos, I've only made a video of the first one. Uh, and if you didn't see my video and you want to see more of this game, then you can watch my video or you can watch someone else's video because other people have also played through this game, of course. It's a very popular game. But yeah, and you start off, you get the pumpkin, and then if you look in your inventory, okay, now you see, oh, how do I... Uh, how do I pull up my inventory? Um, oh, F6. F6 is inventory. Uh, you are carrying pumpkin. So let's see. Let's, can we look at the pumpkin? Pumpkin looks a little odd. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess there's only one of them. If we had two pumpkins, they would be even, but one is odd. That is true. Uh, as well as 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on. Uh, can we open the pumpkin? Okay. The pumpkin breaks open to reveal a key. Yes, we're smashing pumpkins now. Uh, so let's get the, uh, the key, and yeah, you can unlock the door, and I guess I have to open the door after that, and we go inside. Do I have to actually, oh, I have to actually walk inside, right, right into those eyes. I walk directly into those eyes that are, <laughs> that are watching us, and somehow, somehow there are no more eyes once we get inside, unless they were the eyes of that picture of a bat, which somehow I doubt. So yeah, um... Yeah, I guess I don't really need to play this too much because I already played it before, and I think you folks know what to expect. If if any of you are watching my channel, you probably know that if there's any type of game that I am probably associated with, uh, it's Sierra Adventures. And I'm glad about that, actually. I think if there's any type of game that I would like to be associated with, it is Sierra Adventures. Some people like LucasArts games more. Uh, I don't want to denigrate LucasArts games, but I, I'm definitely more of a Sierra person, just in terms of my personal style. I, I love Sierra Adventures. They are probably my single... I think... Uh, I remember reading uh, some years ago that Ken Williams, who was the you know, president and CEO of Sierra, he said he actually got a letter from Steve Wozniak, who, of course, was the engineer who designed the Apple One and Apple II, and Steve Wozniak actually wrote to Ken Williams and said... Your game, uh, he was referring to King's Quest, I believe, your, your games that you're making, your adventure games, are the closest thing that I had in mind to the application of the Apple II when I designed it. Or maybe it was the Apple I, but basically Steve Wozniak wrote, these Sierra adventures are, uh, come closest to what I actually envisioned the uh, the Apple computer being about. And I have to agree with him. These, these games, these types of games, more than any other type of game, really define what a computer game is to me, I think, because a computer game is not, uh, I mean, it can be an action game, it can be like a jump and run platform or an RPG or something like that, but to me, more than anything else, what really encapsulates the computer game experience for me is these games where you just explore, you just walk around, explore, and interact with your environment. So anyway, uh, I, I don't want to wax too lyrical about this because I should probably go on and look at some more games. So that was Hugo's House of Horrors. Uh, I... I was thinking about showing off the other two games. The thing is, I don't want to give any plot spoilers. For those who haven't seen any of the games, I don't want to give away any plot spoilers for this. Uh, the beginning of, of the third game in particular does partly give away the ending of the second game. So if you start playing the third game, then you know how the second one ends, or you have some idea of how the second one ends, so I don't want to show off these games just for that reason alone, um, but they are the exact same type of game. There's really nothing different about them in terms of the style. They're, they're exactly the same engine, exactly the same look and feel, just different stories and different environments, and so so all of them are good games. I heartily give all three Hugo games my thumbs-up seal of approval. Very highly recommend them for anyone who likes old Sierra Adventures. Um, 
Number two is definitely the longest. The first one and the third one are quite short. They're both pretty short. I could finish them in one video. Well, I did finish the first one in one video. The third one is of about the same length. Second one is considerably longer. It's still not very long by, you know, Sierra commercial game standards, but it's definitely longer than the other two. Um, and partly for that reason, and also for other reasons, it's, I think, my favorite in the series. Some people have objected to that. I remember in my a video in Hugo's House of Horrors, I mentioned that the second game is my favorite, and someone actually objected to that statement and said, you got to be kidding. Is, is the second one is really your favorite? You're joking, right? Uh, no, I wasn't kidding. The second one is my favorite. But they're all good. I love all three of them. Moving on now, we come to Humbug. This game is also an adventure in the original sense. I think, I think when I started with the adventure section of the CD, I said that there are only two games here which are true adventures, Hugo's House of Horrors and Last Half of Darkness. That was not true. This one is also an adventure, uh, and I apologize for missing this one. It's in Sophomore 8 Pro 1. Sophomore 8 Pro 1. And there is a doc file. There's even a Windows icon. See that ICO file? That is actually a Windows icon. But we can look at the uh, humbug.doc file. This is a game from Graham Cluley. You may have seen that name uh, more recently in the media uh, because Graham Cluley went on to become a security, like a, a computer security researcher, and he works for some antivirus software company, and he often is quoted in media publications commenting on the latest computer virus or Trojan or worm or whatever. Uh, so he became a, a fairly well-respected, well-known researcher within the field of computer uh, IT information security. So good for him. But before he did that, he wrote Humbug, which is uh, it's a text adventure. And if you don't like text adventures, then forget it. You won't like this game. But if you like text adventures, I can honestly say I've played a lot of text adventures. I've played most of the original Infocom games. I can say, in my personal opinion, I think this is probably the longest and best text adventure I've ever seen in my life. That is, uh, and I don't mean to brag, but I, I think coming from me, that means something because you folks probably know uh, how much I'm into old games, how much I really like games that don't have graphics or have very minimal graphics, very primitive graphics. Uh, so I'm very much into this type of game. And for me to really wholeheartedly and unabashedly uh, endorse this game in terms of its category, uh, I hope that that counts for something. I hope that you folks believe me when I say that this is really a fantastic text adventure if you are into text adventures. Uh, and look, here's a mention of Nels Anderson, uh, the American representative of Mr. Cluley, who is a Brit from, uh, you can see down there, he's from Surrey in the UK. Um, so yeah, please don't telephone me, which makes sense. He probably got, got a lot of phone calls, got enough phone calls as it is. So here's some information on how to play a text adventure if you've never played one before in your life. Here's a mention of Jacaranda Jim, which uh, is the previous text adventure from Mr. Cluley, and uh, which was also a good game, but which I didn't like as much as this one. I mean, Jacaranda Jim, it's it's just a, a, a competent adventure. I mean, it's not bad, but it's uh, really uh, not... I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it surpasses the, the Infocom classics in terms of uh, length or quality or anything. But Humbug is really, um, it really just blew me away with just the sheer scope of the game. Uh, so yeah, Humbug version 4.5. This is a shareware adventure game. Actually, it's, it's freeware now. You can find a freeware version. Um, online uh, pretty easily, I think. It's actually on Mr. Cluley's website, but anyway. Uh, so we have to press A or B to indicate our country. I like how the countries are USA and rest of the world, because there are only two countries in the world. This is actually a very American-centric view of the world, for uh, especially coming from a Brit. I'll say rest of the world. So here's some okay, information on the UK. No calls, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Humbug. Uh, and you play it just like any other text adventure game. You type directions like N for North. East for west. Oh, we can't go in that direction. We're going to go south. Okay, here we can go maybe south. Oh, no, we, okay. Well, here we can go east and we can go west and we can, can we go up? No, you can type U for up and D for down. Can we go northeast? Oh, really? Oh, yes, you can say uh, northeast and northwest, but you can't do N, E, and N, W for some reason. And you can do all this stuff that you would do in a text adventure. You can look at the door. It's a normal door. Oh, and there's a letterbox. Let's look at the uh, letterbox. 
A small brass letter box. It contains an envelope. Ooh, look, we're really making progress here, folks. Look at this. We're already probably solving our first puzzle, how to get that envelope out of the... Uh, Wow, it's addressed to Grandad Widdershins, Adderis Manor, Windmill Lane, Kent. It is still sealed. Let's let's take that envelope. Okay, I've taken the envelope. Let's look at the envelope. Oh, it contains a Christmas card. Let's let's read that card. Wow. This is this is exciting stuff, folks. I mean, okay, again, some people really don't like text adventures like this. Some people take one look at this and think, what kind of primitive nonsense is this? You're just typing and reading endlessly. There are, no graph there are literally no graphics. There is really nothing to it except just typing stuff in. And uh, what is the point? And if you see it that way, then I'm very sorry to strongly disagree with you. I think these games are great. These games are fantastic. I really like this. Uh, these types of games. And, uh, and well, if, if they're not for you, then okay. You Again, you don't have to play them. But, uh, but yeah, I, I very much enjoy these types of games. It would be misleading for me to say that I grew up with these types of games because I'm young enough that I actually grew up already with graphical adventures like, like King's Quest and so on. And so I, these were not my first games. My first adventure game that I ever played was, in fact, the original King's Quest. Uh, and I only came to these games later. Um, but still, very much love these types of games. I uh, think that they are great, and this is, uh, again, probably the best text adventure that I've ever played. But I managed to get 10 points, probably just for getting that envelope. That's not a bad uh, not a bad start. Another go? No, let's quit, quit out to DOS. Um, if you folks want to see me going on for a long time about... Uh, more of my bizarre ideas about game design. In the previous video, I got into quite an extensive discussion with a, a viewer. Somebody left a comment on a previous video, on, on actually on the previous video, the video preceding this one in the series, um, about a comment that I had made about how games should use as many keys as possible. And he very strongly disagreed. I say he because I, I assume it was a he. It might have been a she, but I, I, for some reason I assume it was a he. Um, he very strongly disagreed with this sentiment and said that uh, no games should have as few controls as possible because uh, that makes the games simpler and more intuitive to play. And I disagreed very strongly and said, no, I don't see it that way. And we kind of got into a long discussion. So if you folks are interested in seeing more discussion about that, then of course you can uh, take a look at the comments there. And uh, it got a little bit heated. I don't think it, we got angry. I think there are no hard feelings between us, but uh, we kind of agreed to disagree and it didn't uh, didn't really didn't really convince each other in the end. But I think it's fair to say that there are different types of games for different types of people. I mean, this is a type of game which appeals to me. I like games which involve using lots of buttons on the keyboard because I think that PCs are well suited for that. I don't like games that are very simplistic and, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, there are some very simplistic games which are fun to play, and I do like some of those games as well. But uh, I think that the PC really works well for complex, um, you know, kind of games that use a lot of controls. I mean, a game like a text adventure like this, what we just saw, that's not something that you could really play very well with uh, with a controller. You wouldn't play that with an NES or Xbox 360 controller. It just wouldn't work out very well. And I think that's the kind of game where the PC is uh, well suited to playing such games. So it's just, just my opinion. Uh, and I like those types of games. I tend to prefer those types of games. Maybe I'm just a poser. I don't know. Anyway, Jetpack. Uh, this is also not an adventure game. Uh, it is a very, it is a good game, however. Sophomore Nine Pro Ten. So this is basically another example of a quintessential. Uh, wow, we have a lot of DOC files here. Uh, let's just look at the manual.doc. I feel like I'm doing more talking and looking at text files in this episode than actually. Uh, playing games, which I guess I should probably try to avoid, but again, I, I really want to capture the essence of these games, um, and to me that includes not just playing the game itself, but also looking at the documentation. I'm really big on documentation. Documentation is very important for me in games. I love games that come with 200-page manuals, and I, I really treat them as, uh, as serious literature and not just something to toss away before you play the game. Um, this is a lot of information here, which obviously I'm not going to read now, but um, I mean, I would 
I would find it very interesting to read that kind of thing uh, before I play the game or after I play the game or both. Anyway, let's play Jetpack. Loading Jetpack, exclamation mark. Yes, Jetpack, unregistered, and it's from uh, from Adam Peterson. And I don't remember if that spelling is the Swedish or the Danish spelling. I want to say that's the Danish spelling, but I could be wrong. Anyway, here is Jetpack, and yes, one player type standard. What's the non-standard type? Oh, custom. Okay, I'll, I'll do standard. Let's press S to start. Yes, welcome to Jetpack. Ready player one, level zero. So Jetpack is pretty much a very basic platformer with one major difference. Whoops, uh, if I can figure out how to work work it. All right, there we go. Alt is the key I was looking for. So the major difference is you have a jetpack and that lets you fly around. So your goal is usually just to collect all these green things that I'm collecting, which is fine. Uh, and once you collect all the green things, then the exit door opens. Um, and so in pretty much every regard, it's it's a lot like Load Runner, actually. It's basically like, like Load Runner, except instead of collecting diamonds or jewels or whatever, you're collecting those green things, which actually probably still are jewels, but uh, I don't know what they are. But anyway, this is Load Runner, except that instead of Load Runner, where the gimmick was you had that kind of gun or drill thing which could shoot through the ground, here the gimmick is your tool is this jetpack, which lets you fly around. So it's like Load Runner, except uh, flying around, which is kind of cool, because flying around is very cool. And that's it. This is pretty much the uh, pretty much the whole essence of the game. You've already seen the the idea behind the game. Uh, if you like what you see, you will very much like this game. It is exactly what you see. What you see is what you get. This is a simple game. Uh, this is the kind of game which you don't need a PC to play. You could very easily play this on a console or pretty much anything. Um, and I don't mean to imply that this is a bad game. I just, from what I was saying before, I just... How do, I, how do I flip the switch? How do I flip the switch? Oh no, I don't know how to flip switches in this game. Or push buttons or whatever it was. There's gotta be a way. Oh, you press down. Pressing down pushes buttons and flips switches and things like that. Um, so yeah, I don't mean in any way to suggest that this kind of game is bad. I love these types of games too, but People tend to denigrate games which are complicated and have a lot of controls, and people complain and say, oh, the, this game had a 200-page manual, so I threw everything away because I didn't want to read that manual. And that kind of attitude uh, bothers me a little bit because I think that games with 200-page uh, manuals are actually very interesting. They have a lot of depth to them, or they can have. I mean, obviously the fact that a game has a big manual doesn't automatically mean that it's good. It could still be a, a bad game. But I've, I've seen many games which... Uh, had huge manuals for a very good reason, and I just got killed by that spring thing. Uh, so yeah, Jetpack. Great game. Uh, obviously a very different game from Humbug or uh, or Hugo's House of Horrors or stuff like that, but uh, yeah, great game. Everything about this game is good. It's, uh, I mean, the graphics are spot on. The sound effects are simple but effective. There's no music, but oh well. Maybe music doesn't really suit this type of game anyhow. Uh, what can I say? Good all around. The controls are great. Uh, it has a level designer, a level editor, so you can make your own levels. And uh, yeah, what you see is what you get. If you like this type of game, then you should play this because I don't think you'll be disappointed. And if you don't like this type of game, then obviously you wouldn't play it. So that was the end of that. Jetpack. Wait, how do I get out? I pressed escape, but it didn't actually escape. Do I have to do I have to, do I have to actually run out of lives or Oh dear, how do I get out? Is there another key do I have to do I have to actually use up all my lives or is there another Okay. I got game over. Oh, and I got a high score because nobody else has played this game. Alright, that's fine. Can I yes, game over. Can I quit now? Can I quit, please, now? Oh, now pressing escape doesn't do anything, it just plays that sound effect. I guess, there we go, pressing Q was what I needed to do. All right. Uh, we're already almost at half an hour. Should I, uh, I'll play one more game. Just one more for good measure. Uh, so we'll just play the last adventure game here, Last Half of Darkness. This is a horror adventure, which I didn't play very much of because I'm usually not into horror games, but... Uh, 
Let's take a look. Hugo's House of Horrors is not a horror adventure, by the way. It's, it's, I mean, it comically looks like a horror game, but it's not. But this is an actual kind of spooky game, which um, kind of bothers me. I don't usually like scary stuff for some reason. I, I don't, this doesn't really, how did Caps Lock get on? Oh, it must have, I must have pressed it when I tried to type A. Okay, last half. So here we go. Soft Labs Last Half of Darkness. And again, it, it uses a smaller screen resolution, so that thing is flickering at the bottom of the screen. I apologize for that. Uh, so there's a hint book available. It's from Soft Labs, Software Laboratories in San Diego, California. Last Half of Darkness, press any key to begin. So here we go. Here's the game, and you play this with a mouse, actually. I think this might, might be one of the first games we've seen on this CD that actually has mouse control. Um, if any of you have seen the classic horror adventure games from ICOM simulations. Um, like, uh, the one that comes to my mind is Uninvited, because I actually played that as a kid. Um, I think also in that category are Deja Vu and maybe games like... Um, I, I feel very certain that there's at least one other game that used a similar engine, but I can't seem to think of the name of it right now. Uh, but basically the idea is that, okay, so here you have a static picture which kind of shows you where you are. Then here you have a list of commands that you can click on. And <clears throat> and then here are the exits. So you can click on exits to go places. So, um, yeah, you can't walk through the door. So you have to click on open. And then you click on the door and it opens. And then you can click. And of course you can look at stuff as well. Like you can look at that uh, candle there. The torch is unlit and very old. Can I take it? Yes. Uh, no, I can't. It says you can't take that. So it's basically like... Um, it's kind of like the LucasArts Adventures in that it has a list of verbs here that you can perform, but it's unlike LucasArts games in that um, you, it's first person, so you don't see yourself on the screen. You just see a static picture, and then you see... It, it's kind of like games like... Um, I mean, Legend Entertainment made a, a lot of games that were sort of like this, except they were texted games. So they had they had static pictures, but then they were text adventures here at the bottom where you had to actually type in commands in a text parser. Games like the Spellcasting series, so Spellcasting 101, 201, and 301. Um, Eric the Unready, games like that. Um, this is kind of similar, except it's point and click. So yeah, you can go here and... All the graphics are blue for some reason. I guess the point is that it's supposed to be dark because it's, you know, the last half of darkness or whatever. Or, well, it's it's nighttime outside, and so I guess they wanted to create the effect of it being dark everywhere by making everything kind of blue. But it does make the graphics look a little bit uh, monotonous. I don't know. I think the graphics look okay, even though they are very, uh, they are very completely monochrome. But... Um, Let's see, can I take those old relics from World War II? Take... No, I can't. Can I take that? No. Can I... Oh, you can hit... Can I hit the chair? Nothing was damaged. Okay. All right. Uh, this room contains relics dating back to the 18th century. Uncle is a collector of fine war weapons. Yeah, I mean... It's... Uh, it seems like a pretty decent adventure, um, and it does seem very much inspired by Uninvited. Uh, if you are interested in this kind of thing, and if, especially if you like horror adventure games, I can highly recommend Uninvited. I actually recently, uh, not that long ago, took another look at Uninvited, and it is a very nice game. It has a very nice writing style. I kind of like the, the style of that game because it does make a lot of references to sort of fine art and high culture in a way which maybe is kind of pretentious, but still it's sort of, uh, it suited the original Macintosh well. Uninvited was a game which uh, which was made for the original Macintosh and um, and it was then ported to the Apple IIgs, which I played it on, but also many other platforms. It was ported, I think, even to the NES. I think it was ported to the NES, to the PC, and uh, let's see, is there something in here? Yeah, can I, can I go there? I hope we don't see anything spooky. I don't want to shock my viewers with anything terrifying. Um, but, I mean, this game doesn't have a lot of really horrifying stuff in it, but it does have some kind of spooky sort of... Uh, I don't know if you'd call them jump scare moments, but there are some spooky moments where it gets kind of a little bit... Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, haven't seen anything too spooky so far. 
There's a chalkboard on the left that says I'm going to kill her. <laughs> it's just your average chalkboard with I'm going to kill her written on it. Uh, bookcase is empty. This bookcase contains mostly ghost stories. This bookcase looks like a secret passage or something because... Uh, no? Or maybe this one is? No? Can I read the books? Can I take the books? There's no time for ca there is no time for casual reading now. All right. What's that thing on the wall? It looks almost like an intercom or something. Oh, it's a barometer predicting rain. All right. There's a skull, a lit candle. All right. Anyway, this is last half of darkness. Um, it's not bad. I do like, I do like this uh, presentation. I mean, it is what it is. A lot of people know that I don't like point and click adventures and prefer parsers, and that's true. But I mean, I, I'm not necessarily against point and click games, and this is. Uh, it's pretty decent. I mean, I do like the... There's a certain ambience to it, a certain charm to it, which uh, which I can't deny. So, um, if what you've seen is interesting, then obviously check it out. Um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty good. But uh, again, if you, if you do like this type of game, if you think this looks interesting at all, then again, I highly recommend Uninvited. Um, as well as games with elk, I like, like I said, I think also the Deja Vu series are of a similar, uh, similar sort of style. So, there you go. Last half of darkness. Let's quit. Are you sure? Yeah, sure. Let's quit. All right, and that was that. All right, folks. Uh, that is all the adventure games we saw. We saw all three adventure games on the CD in one episode: uh, Hugo's House of Horrors, Humbug, and now Last Half of Darkness. So that's it. That's going to be it for adventure games on this CD. The rest is, uh, well, other types of games. So. We will see that in the future, but I will go ahead and stop now, and I will say thank you to everyone again for watching. Hope that you are enjoying this journey with me into the depths of the GameFest CD, and we will see more of the CD later. Until then, folks, bye-bye for now, and uh, don't... Uh, I'm trying to think of something witty to say at the end here. Surely I can think of something witty to say after playing three adventure games. Uh, no, I can't. I'll just say, don't, uh, don't make your Half of Darkness last too long. Why did I say that? That's such a stupid thing to say. It would have been better if I'd said nothing. It would have been better if I'd just not... Now I feel stupid. I said the stupidest thing in the world to end the video with. I'm just going to stop now. Thanks for watching, everyone.